what are you made of? Not in like a tough guy way, like what are you made of? Like, what are you actually made of? Organs and bones? No, I need to be more specific than that. Memories and experiences. No, that's a bit deep for me right now. Uh, <laughs> I know. Everything is made of cells. No past video, Sophie. You, you're kind of there, but it's not quite precise enough for this video. What, what are your cells made of? Well, proteins and DNA and cytoplasm and rough endoplasmic reticulum. No, but what are those made of? I'll just tell you, I'll just tell you, I'll tell you. It's atoms, okay? I'm talking about atoms. I mean, I'm actually just a bunch of atoms talking about atoms. Listen, the whole reason that you're here is because you're just a bunch of atoms that have happened to be knotted together in such a way that you've tumbled into existence. Without atoms, well, you'd literally be nothing because they are what you're made of. It's not just your body though. The food you eat is made of atoms. The sweat you sweat is made of atoms. The air you breathe is made of atoms. Everything is made of atoms. <laughs> and where did all these atoms come from? My ceiling. No, space. <laughs> Atoms come in all sorts of different flavours, but we don't call them flavours, we call them elements. So you can get oxygen atoms, nitrogen atoms, carbon atoms, helium atoms, beryllium atoms, there's all sorts. Um, and all of the different flavours of atom are put onto the periodic table. Which means that the periodic table is basically just a menu. Atoms are made up of three main things. You've got protons and neutrons in the middle and electrons around the outside. The number of protons determines the flavour of the atom. In other words, determines the element that it is. Hydrogen, for example, has one proton, helium has two protons, lithium has three protons, beryllium has four protons, and so on and so forth. When the universe first began, the main element that was knocking around was hydrogen. And as I've said, hydrogen are one proton ponies. But then stars started forming and they powered themselves by smashing atoms together. Because even though it takes some energy to smash atoms together, when you manage it, they release a lot of energy in return. And then that powers the star. But it's this process of smashing atoms together that turn atoms of one element into atoms of other elements. So for this next bit, I've got some letters written on my hand, wrote them backwards because I thought it was being clever to help with the camera. Turns out the camera flips this back anyway. Now I look like the idiot. So the screen's gonna flip and then it's gonna flip back. And that's show business, people. If I have two atoms that both have one proton, they're both hydrogen atoms. But then if I smash those together, I'm gonna get a helium. If I then take another helium and smash those two together, I'm gonna get a beryllium, which has got four protons. And then if I get another hydrogen and smash that to the beryllium, I'm gonna get a five proton boron. If I then get another hydrogen and smash that to the boron, I, anyway, I don't have enough fingers, but you get the idea. <laughs> so stars are essentially atomic kitchens, cooking up every different flavor of element. Although it is worth noting, elements that are heavier than iron can't be cooked up in stars because it takes too much energy to push them together. So they're actually cooked up in supernovae, which are star explosions. And those explosions have enough energy to force heavier elements together. And that's how we get elements that are heavier than iron. So all atoms originate from stars or star explosions. As Joni Mitchell says, we are stars. Yes, we are Joni. <laughs> because those star-made atoms include yours and mine and Queen Victoria's and Cleopatra's and penguins and tigers and sloths and the first plants and the trees that grow in the Amazon and atoms of everybody, including this gal here. I'm in my mum's car. Broom, broom. And of course, Shakespeare's atoms. Oh, the title has come into play. Because here's the thing, atoms get recycled. Atoms you breathe out get taken in by plants, which then use them to grow, and then you eat the plants, or you eat the animals that eat the plants, and then look, the atoms are back in your body. And this atom recycling doesn't just keep to your local postcode. Atoms you breathe out get thrown worldwide within months by the wind and the weather. Any atoms that find their way to the sea spread around the world within a few years. And the water cycle, what with its evaporation and raining, helps the atoms spread from sea to land. And our Earth, being this self-perpetuating ecosystem that it is, has perfected this atomic recycling in such a way that we can be here. We survive, here we are. But what this means is that the atoms in our bodies have also been in the bodies of other people, including William Shakespeare. So the question is, how many of your atoms were at one point in Shakespeare? P? When I read this, it absolutely blew my little Lancastrian mind. Uh, and I knew I had to share it on here. 
it, but I didn't actually find it, so I owe a thank you to JT for bringing it to my attention first. I am gonna do some major summarizing though, so if you wanna get into the mathematical detail, then check out the link to the original piece in the description. So let's get a little bit mathsy. Well, firstly, how many atoms are there in the environment that have touched Shakespeare? Well, when considering his atoms, the team at Jupiter Scientific split them into three categories. The first category is atoms that have come off his body since he died. So that's things like liquids that might have evaporated from him, or bits of skin that might have come off his body before he got buried. The other two categories actually make up the majority of the Shakespearean atoms. Those are atoms he breathed out while he was alive, and atoms that he really in the form of waste products. They say you should avoid imaginative thought here, but I think why not go wild? Think about all the different possibilities of Shakespeare's waste products. So when using these three categories to work out the total number of Shakespearean atoms, we can make a few estimations. For example, breath-wise, if we know that Willie lived to the age of 52 and assume that he breathed out about 15 times a minute, we can calculate he probably breathed out about 400 million times in his life. And if that's the number of times that a 52 year old breathes out in their life, then Sting has a lot of breaths to watch. By making estimations in ways like that for the three sources, the Jupiter scientific team work out that there's probably about seven times 10 to the power of 30 Shakespearean atoms in the environment. That number basically means that there's seven with 30 zeros after it number of Shakespearean atoms in our world. And I'm sure we can all agree that's a really relatable number that we can all get our head around the scale of. Now the team also worked out that including the Earth's lower atmosphere, the oceans, the landmass, and all the flora and fauna on the landmass, then altogether the Earth's environment probably has about 1.4 times 10 to the 47 number of atoms in it. That number just means 14 with 46 zeros after it. Another easily relatable number, I'm sure we'll all agree. But now we know how many Shakespearean atoms there are in the world, and indeed how many atoms there are in our our world's environment as a whole. But let's get a bit more introspective and consider how many atoms are there in a human body. Well, we're all beautifully unique individuals, so I'm afraid I am going to have to do some guesstimation here. And when I say I am, I mean the team at Jupiter Scientific because I can take literally no credit for any of this maths because I didn't do any of it. But they reckon that in an 80 kilogram human, there are about four times 10 to the power 27 atoms. That's four with 27 zeros after it. I promise that the number of Shakespearean atoms is a number that you can actually say without saying number of zeros. So just wait, wait up. But the point is that we have three numbers. We have the number of atoms in the whole environment of the world as a whole. We have the number of Shakespearean atoms in the world as a whole. And we have the number of atoms in your body. Now, the brainiacs at Jupiter Scientific plug these three numbers into this equation where S is the number of Shakespearean atoms, E is the number of environmental atoms, and B is the number of body atoms in a human body. And they come out with this number. 200 billion. That is how many of your atoms have also touched Shakespeare. 200 billion. I'm sure some very kind individual is gonna put a comment with a timestamp at that point to save everyone who looks at the comments from having to watch the rest of my drivel because that is the answer. Now, although we're losing and gaining atoms all the time from things like breathing in and breathing out, because the rate is kind of constant, we're pretty much giving out Shakespearean atoms at the same rate that we're taking them in. We're kind of like a conveyor belt for Shakespearean atoms, which means that we can say this number 200 billion is pretty much constant. And actually, it turns out about one in seven of your Shakespearean atoms came from his waist. So I'm afraid you're kind of full of sh If you want atoms from pure Shakespeare, in other words, from that first category that I mentioned earlier, the ones that have shed off him since he died, then I'm afraid it's going to be a lot fewer. It all depends on the estimation of how many grams of his body escaped after death. But with the estimations Jupiter Scientific make, they reckon that you've got around 10,000 atoms that have come straight from deceased Shakespeare's body. And we all know no, that's barely anything, right? And if you're a Brit like me, you can maybe even claim to have a few more Shakespearean atoms in you. He's supposedly buried at the Holy Trinity Church in Stratford-upon-Avon, and so if his atoms haven't managed to travel that far from there, then perhaps Brits are more likely to have a bit more of Shakespeare in them. But I mean, look at it. It's obvious that we're gonna have more of the Bard in us, what with our natural poetic romanticism. I'm in my mum's car. Broom, broom. Of course, and you're probably already thinking it, 
it's not just Shakespeare. You'll have about that many atoms from anyone who's lived as long as Shakespeare. You'll probably have more atoms from people who lived longer. But how is that possible? How can I have everyone in me? Because I get around. <laughs> Now, of course, this brings us full circle right back to the beginning, because it's not like Shakespeare can claim ownership over his atoms. It's not like they walk around with a little moustache and a ruff and have an ear for iambic pentameter. Some of Shakespeare's atoms would have been some of Caesar's atoms, and some of Caesar's atoms would have been some of Genghis Khan's atoms. They all get passed along. Atoms never belong to one person. So yes, you do have some of Shakespeare's atoms, congratulations, but you also have some atoms from everyone who's ever lived, and every animal, and every plant, and a bit of the sea and a bit of the air. But isn't that just absolutely incredible? Realising things like that, it makes you recognise just how many atoms you have in you. Like it's, just like, like it's just like, what's the chance that like all those atoms will pile up in such a way that we've got life and creatures and poetry and thinking and Oh, these are, these, are, these are legit train thoughts. This is what I think about the train. This, this, I feel like I'm on a train right now. But if I were to give this video a moral message, and I guess I'm doing that by saying this, then maybe I'd say, you know, take this as a reminder that we should look after the planet more because the atoms in, you know, the plants and animals that exist here might end up in you or someone you love one day. Also, and I thought about this quite like recently when I wasn't like researching for this video, so, you know, I've not really researched it. Let me know what you think. If we use atoms to make stuff like plastic that doesn't degrade and therefore doesn't add to the world's recycling of atoms, then surely those atoms are just sitting there when they could be being used by someone else. Stop using my atoms. This is a plastic bottle. It's a Jack Wills body spray for those of you who are wondering. So there we go, a reminder that our big old spinning marble is just made of a constantly recycling set of atoms and that we all have a little bit of Shakespeare in us. It's been a bit of a different video from me but I've certainly enjoyed making it uh, and researching it so I hope you enjoyed it too. Like this video if you like it, share it if you share it, subscribe it if you subscribe it and tweet me if you tweet. Thank you so much for watching, have a lovely day and remember this above all to thine own self be true and it must follow as the night the day thou canst not then be false to any man. Am I quoting Shakespeare, or myself, or Legally Blonde the Musical? <laughs> I'm in my mum's summary. Broom, broom. Get out this summary. <laughs> my old vines, my jam. They are apparently, but there we go. There's the summary, pause it and read it if you're so inclined. That you don't know what you got till it's gone. This video is gonna be really weird, I feel. All I've written for this bit is do this with magic finger trick bants, do something clever with it, and the hiding fingers. I think I've made it work. Yes, this is sick! <laughs> I'm buzzing. Work it harder, make it better, do it faster, makes it stronger. I'm absolutely hyped over this, I think it's really smart. <laughs> As Joni Mitchell says, no. it's not what I want you to say right now, Joni. It's not just your body though, mm, this is your body. Oh, why can I still not wing? Scientific interest is a spectrum. Call me Rude, because that's my name. Rude's Notes. <laughs>